Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our presentation this afternoon. Uh, we are the DIY Girls, and our pre presentation revolves around the mechatronic sensors and 3D printing, uh, all to which we incorporated for our capstone project, the Intelli plant. Okay, first off, we would like to introduce ourselves. We're four students from San Fernando High School, which is located in the Northeast San Fernando Valley. Um, and we joined forces after school for the completion of this project. So starting off, my name is Adanelli and I'm a senior. I've been a part of DIY Girls since elementary and upon high school graduation will be one of the first to have completed their entire program. Uh, and I want to pursue mechanical engineering in college. Um, my name is Alexa, I am a sophomore and I have been with DIY Girls for two years now and I am planning to pursue computer science in college. I'm Kimberly and I'm a senior in high school. I've been with DIY Girls, DIY Girls for two years now and I want to pursue a, a degree in electrical engineering, computer engi and engineering. Hello, my name is Cynthia. I'm in 12th grade and I'm planning to pursue computer science and I've been with DIY Girls for two years. We are a part of an after-school program with DIY Girls, which is a nonprofit organization that uh, also located in the Northeast San Fernando Valley, uh, whose mission is to empower girls and gender expansive youth to spark an interest in STEM through hands-on projects. So as aforementioned, some of us have been in this program since last year, while others since fifth grade. Uh, we are proud to be a part of a program that increases the number of women in STEM through uh, learning new skills and improving our skill sets. Uh, DIY Girls has had a huge impact in our community and we hope that by the end of our presentation, um, we can have at least a sprinkle of that impact uh, in you. Here you will see the breakdown of our presentation. We will introduce the project, explain the breakdown of how to DIY this project should you want to build one at home. Uh, and lastly, we will show you a demo video uh, of how our project worked for us and conclude with a Q&A should you have any questions. So the Intelli plant is an Arduino-powered self-watering plant pot that monitors the soil moisture, sunlight intake, and provides visual feedback. As part of our after-school program, we met weekly to build our own Intelli plant, uh, and given the amount of time and STEM com concepts and DIY hardware, uh, we were broken into three subgroups to maximize this time. So this is a photo of Cynthia's complete IntelliPlant. As you can see, we used a wooden crate and that gave us the opportunity to personalize it to our own liking using paint. Inside, uh, to the left, you could see a storage box which includes the Arduino and its electrical components. Uh, in the middle, you have the flower and the soil sensor in addition to the LED display. And lastly, on the right, we have the water tank and its tube. Our entire group was divided into different subgroups and each part, each group was in charge of a certain part of our entire um, project. So I was part of the mechatronics team and our obje objective was to create the self-watering component of the project and it was using information from the sensors team and we had to find the most efficient way to get water to the plant without burning out the pump that we were using and our goal, our final goal was to have um, our water pump be able to switch on and off depending on um, whether the plant needed water. Um, so this is, um, we'd like to start with like the main component, uh, main component of our project, which is an Arduino. It's a microcontroller that uses open source hardware and software. Um, for this project, we used um, the IDE, which is an integrated development environment. Um, it's easy to use for beginners and advanced students, um, but mainly we decided to use this to be able to connect all of our components and share um, information from one another to be able to make this whole plant 
function and have these connections between um, the LED ma matrix, the sensors, and the water pump. Um, as you can see right here with our web editor, this is, um, this is free to use. It's an own website that you can use at home and you could find. Um, this website has its own libraries and it has um, code that's already integrated and um, it allows you to verify and upload this in any of your code to the Arduino, um, which brings our point to what Mechatronics stands for, which is um, Mechanical Engineering Integra and Integrating Electronics. Um, so this is our first component. Or our first component is the relay, which is, um, serves our purpose as like an on and off switch. Um, so when it reads um, yes, or it's our green light to go, this is when we know that the water pump is actively pumping. And if it's off, then the water pump isn't pumping, and so there's no water getting to the plant. Um, uh, our main thing was the water tank, which was where we would get the water from. We would fill it, and that's um, inside the water tank. We had copper tape, which was um, pasted along the side of the jar, and we had wires connected to that copper tape that would allow the connection from inside the tank to outside and, and be able to um, actually get the information to the Arduino and to whatever other components it needed to get to. Um, along with the side of the copper wire and the, I mean, the copper tape and the wires, we had our water pump, which was, um, it had, it was a five, power amps with five volts. Um, this is what actually would take in the water and it, we had a pipe connected to it so that it would be able to flow directly into the plant. Um, that's our components for that part. Um, this is our functionality of what our whole purpose was. What we spent majority of our time working on was the actual water pump, I mean, water tank itself. Um, these two wires are what we mainly focused on how we would be able to make this function. So the one on the bottom is our, recognizes our ground. So this technically means that this is what, this is what keeps this at a level, or like at a good level, um, throughout the entire process. And the top copper tape was our limit. And this served as kind of, because water is conductive and it has um, minerals that have ions, um, as long as the water kept touching this, we knew that the tank had water. But the second that the water was no longer in contact with our top tape, um, it would be able to send a me message to the actual owner to let them know that our water tank doesn't have any more water. Um, yeah. And these two wires are what set it outside. So this is connected to our ground on the Arduino. And this is connected to our five volts, which actually powers the entire thing. Or no, actually, I'm so sorry. But um, this is our water level pin. So it's just like the level of water. And it was connected to pin, which we'll later see in the code. So this is our entire diagram. Um, as you can see, we have our positive and our negative for the water pump. Um, these grounds, or the negatives were all ground, so all these black um, wires, as you can see, are ground, but the Arduino only has places for um, three. So at the end of the day, we did have to solder m the grounds together, and, um, oh, and uh, our, like, five volts, um, which are positive, or some of our positive wires, to be able to actually um, incorporate them into the Arduino. Um, this is our, our on kind, or, yeah, our on component. Uh, so what this was is that this is our, this is our <laughs> five volts of the power. Um, as you can see, like earlier, as I said, we have our water level wire, which is connected to the seven pin, which is later how we read the information inside the tank. Um, yeah, that's pretty much how the whole flow goes in, and you can see how it's all connected. Um, inside the thing we have in if else statements and this is practically saying if the water tank value is equal to one um, our relay pin which is what the which is a actual um, uh, how do you say um, like the relay the actual relay which is our on and off switch is how it's connected so the meaning behind high is means it's on and low means that it's off so that means um, 
it, there's also like printed so we could actually visually see a water pump is on and it would only have a set timing for when the water pump would be pumping and when it would stop. Um, yeah. Thank you, Alexa. Now we're moving on to the sensor's objective. So the sensor's team objective was to connect and program the sensors that monitor the plant's sunlight and water intake. Essentially, our main goal was to define the plant's thresholds values that determine at which point each plant was either too wet, too dry, or just right. So one of our team challenges was deciding which top two plants we would utilize. Uh, this, was, this process was especially challenging because we had different plant preferences. And most importantly, we had to take into account the amount of water and sunlight intake each plant had in order for us to determine whether it was suitable for our project. And on a more technical scale, another one of our challenges was testing the soil moisture level with the soil moisture sensor, which I'll explain a little bit further. Um, and that was especially challenging for my team because the sensor had a relatively slow response at determining when the plant was either too wet, too dry, or just right. So here are the main components for the sensors team. Um, we, our components consist of the photoresistor and a soil moisture sensor. So the photoresistor was used to measure how much light was being emitted into the plant. Uh, so essentially that data was used to determine whether the user would have to move the plant. So we tested this by just going outside and putting the photoresistor in direct light in the sunlight. And we also put it in areas with shade or areas that had both. And then for the soil moisture sensor, that was used to determine the amount of moisture that the soil had. So that determined whether it was too dry or too wet. And so we researched many plants and we made sure that each had a watering system and each had sunlight intake for indoors. So essentially we chose the pothos plant and the cyclamen plant. And these scales right here at the bottom indicate when each plant needs, or when each soil in the plant is too wet or too dry. Uh, we used the serial monitor to do this. So essentially, over here, as you can see, the value from 0 to 30, that's too wet, so too much water. So the water pump won't pump any water out. And then values 31 to 49 is just right. And then 50 onward would be not enough water, so it would pump out water. And then for the cyclamen plant, what Alexa mentioned in the mechatronics team for their circuit. Um, but the main takeaway here is the resistor. The resistor um, control the current, so it will, it would be at like safe levels. Um, and here we used a 1K ohm resistor for the photoresistor in particular, and then a 220 ohm resistor for the LED for the display. And here is the sensor's code. So essentially, we define the soil sensor pin at A0 on the Arduino. And the uh, moisture value, we put that as 0. And more importantly, we began the serial, we began it at 9,600. Um, and the main takeaway here is the if-else statements that Alexa mentioned as well. Um, essentially, the if-else statements would work to uh, determine whether, like I mentioned, whether the plant soil was too wet, too dry, or just right. And you can think of the if-else statement like a, a decision-making statement. So maybe you could think of um, a middle, like students in middle school. So it could be if the students are from age like 11 to 12, they're in sixth grade. If they're from else, if they're from 13 to 14, they're in seventh grade, and then else they're in eighth grade. So you could think of it like that. Uh, this is another sensor's code. This is the code overview. Essentially, uh, this is for the photoresistor code, um, which allows us to detect the uh, 
the light intake from the plant. So once again, we measured the photoresistor outside, but that's how we tested it, and then this is the code for it. Um, once again, for the photoresistor, we put that at A1 on the uh, Arduino, and then light value, we assign that as zero, and then once again, the serial begins at 9600. Hello. And the second subgroup was to display the um, the to it was basically to per personalize our own casing for the LED matrix and to see if it's um, to see its portability. So the three components to um, to meet our objective was. The LED matrix, which is an 8 by 8 um, LED pixel screen, which is used to display the symbols of our um, the, the plant's needs, and you can find the find it on Adafruit.com. Our third component was the LED matrix code, which was used um, to give to give signals to the LED matrix to display which lights we want on and which lights we want off. And the LED matrix was to, um, also used to display um, different colors and how long we want that image to be on. Our third component was the LED matching casing. We were each able to customize our own and it was to, um, to basically stand up on our plant correctly and so we can face, I guess, everything else. And we used Tinkercad to, three, and we, um, Tinkercad to design each one and we 3D printed it. So the LED matrix function, um, as I said before, the matrix is an 8x8 eight by, eight by eight pix, um, pixel screen. Um, so how it worked is that we wanted to, at a design team, we decided that we, there was different needs of each plant that we wanted to display. Um, some of them were if we wanted, we wanted um, the image to display if it needed less or more water, if it needed less or more sun, or if the water tank was running low, and also if the plant was perfectly fine and didn't need any maintenance. So um, we were able to use LED matrix to, disp to display our own symbols. As you can see, I was, um, one of the girls in our teams were using a cactus to display that it was too dry. Um, at first, we were having difficulty displaying more than one color, um, but at, throughout fixing our code, we were able to display more than two, as you can see also in the image. So um, for the LED matrix code, we use binary code, which means that we use zeros and ones. Zeros to display that we want that specific square to be off, and uh, oh, sorry, zero displaying that we want it to be off and one saying that we want the LED to be on. So we used the emoji bitmap to display what kind of symbols we wanted and then we had another box on the side to display how the code would look when we um, convert it. So um, as you can see in this image that one of the girls wanted kind of it opposite where we wanted the cloud to show, to show off and everything to show color. So you can see in the bitmap that um, the cloud is filled with zeros to show that it's off, and then the white parts would be ones to show that it's on. And then these are some examples of the casings we used, um, and we'll let Cynthia display how we personalized everything. Okay, as for, as for the LED matrix compartment casing, I was in charge of making sure that all the measurements were on par with the LED matrix and making sure that it was a right fit. We thought that including a casing would be important because we wanted to make sure that all the components were protected and also it would be like more organized as well. We also thought that it'd be important to incorporate it because we also needed to, Im we also had to put a stick that would connect the, our casing to the soil so that it would be able to stand up correctly. And our third reason would be that we also wanted to make sure that it would give the girls an opportunity to be able to customize their casings and make it more personalized for them. So the program that we use is Tinkercad, which is a free open source platform that uses computer design to model design. So 
I made sure to incorporate the backpack, which is the green component there, I mean the gray component, and we had to make sure that everything fit correctly and also include a hole for the wires to go through. And I provided this to all, the, all my peers with the digital classroom um, feature on Tinkercat. And I was able to retrieve their designs from there and then move on with that and print it out. And as for the top casing, um, I only provided with them with the measurements for the actual screen. And from there, they were able to create their own top casings. And this is an example of mine. I created a Game Boy console. And the following slide, you're going to see some of the examples of what other girls did. And the previous one also demonstrated some of them as well. OK, as for Tinkercat, this is the program that we use. As I mentioned previously, it's an open um, source design, modeling, and circuit simulator platform. And in the video, you can see how there's different features here. We're just demonstrating a demo of how it's ungrouping and grouping. And there's also a feature of slicing, which makes it possible for there to be holes, which can be seen with the transparent solids or figures. And that just allows there to be more preciseness with the measurements. And additionally, there's also another tool of Scribble, which allows, the, which allows some of the girls to create their own um, designs off of scratch. So that's like their own personal, you know, more personalized way to design their casing. And we also use Tinkercat for circuits, so it's not only 3D designing, but for the circuits, we made sure to create them on Tinkercat and see if they worked there, and that would be easier to um, see if it worked in real life. So if there are any issues with the actual software, then like on the real one, we would make sure that those issues didn't occur since we would fix it in Tinkercat. Okay, so for the 3D um, design printers, we used um, two of them. One of, we used two of them because we were only to complete one third of the design process in, on site, and the rest was completed at the DIY Girls site. So we used the inventor, and this 3D printer, unfortunately, is discontinued, but it was very great as it was like noiseless, and we were able to get it from a, we were able to get it from a supporter from San Francisco of DIY Girls, but it could also be found online if you search it up. But another great option that we also used is the Kitty One X12, and that one also was very um, helpful in helping us create the project. The only thing is that that one does have noise compared to the inventor. And we also, oh, there's also the programs here that we used for the slicing and they're different for each one. As for the IntelliPrint circuit, here you can see how there's all the different compartments of the hardware all complete. It can look intimidating, but since we all um, separated in different sections, we were able to combine it together and make it all work. Um, we suggest that if you guys pursue this project that you also look at it from different perspectives and then combine it to make it much easier. And then also keep in mind that with the breadboard, we made sure to replace it with a PCB to make sure that it just was more compacted and more suitable for our project. And also regarding the code, um, we included the mechatronics team code first because, um, I know actually, sorry, we included the sensors team first and that basically like got in all the input, like the sunlight with the photoresistor and uh, um, we also got the sensor from the mo soil moisture. So from that, we were able to incorporate after that the mechatronics programming. So from that, we were able to, base based on the sensors, like we were able to get the information and run our mechatronics based on what the input was. So if there was like too much, air, too much sunlight, then the water pump would input more water. So overall, we were able to complete the engineering design process and adjustments, which can be seen with how we were able to complete our whole program and, and teleplant. Our problem initially, and the reason that we wanted to create this project was because we wanted a system that would be able to water 
our plant maybe if we were home or simply just allow it to do it with us without us manually having to water it. The only thing that we would have to incorporate or manually do ourselves is fill in the water tank. And then for brainstorming, we just had our ideas, our designs, and we build it and share the solutions, which was our challenges and moving on with that. We were able to complete the IntelliPlant. One of the specific problems that we did have, like as an example of the engineering design, was how we initially, we started with the water tube, but it was for the, as the water tank, but it was something that didn't work out and it wasn't as efficient. So we decided to go forth with the glass jar and it was much more efficient. And we were able to build and design our, our overall IntelliPlant and it was like a great experience. So I really hope that you guys enjoy this presentation and hope you guys also are inspired to create your own IntelliPlant. Okay, I know you guys all wanna go home to build your own because it was that amazing. Um, but before you guys go, do you guys have any questions? There's also, um, for the iteration process, if we were to create um, or fix our IntelliPlant, there would be some things that we would change. So for starters, we would make the diameter for our water pump wider, I mean shorter, because it's too wide, so sometimes it pumps too much water. We would also want to use a different, um, a different box for our components, since we used a stacker box from Michaels. So maybe we could use something more efficient that would prevent, if water were to get in there, to prevent water from damaging the electronics. And then lastly, we would also want to incorporate, um, oh, also have a better tape for the circuit jar, since we use a nylon tape and we think we could have used something more durable. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, can you um, give, how much storage does your Arduino have? Can you give me or me and him a copy of the code of the JavaScript? And because uh, I recognize the code on the screen as JavaScript because yes, I do is. some JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you give us like the the circuiting, like a diagram, like the blueprints of the circuiting? Uh, yes, the, all the details and all the presentation will be, um, will be out for you guys to look at and be able to build it on your own. Uh, it's on GitHub? Yeah, we'll, we'll put it on GitHub. Okay, cool. Um, my question was, where do you put the moisture sensor in the plant? Like, what depth? How did you know? Uh, we just put it all the way down, so... The, our moisture sensor looks like this. Um, and we just take it right in our soil so it kind of senses, senses how our soil um, like needs more water or just to dry or something like that. Any more questions? Okay. How much storage does your um, Arduino have? Does it have more than a megabyte or less than a megabyte? Because I have an Arduino at home and it has less than a megabyte of storage. You guys know? And what operating system does it use or are you just coding the bare metal? Uh, just the regular components. Like, meaning that, um, that we just use Don't forget, kids, if you ask a question, I go to you first. <laughs> oh. Hi. You mentioned a water control problem about overwatering. Is there a plan to put some type of feedback system in where you know how much water you're dispensing? Um, sorry, can you speak a little louder? I can uh, hear you. You'd mentioned that you might have an overwatering problem mm -hmm. because of the diameter of the tube. Uh, is there any plans to put a feedback system in where you are able to measure the flow of water and get a little bit more control over it? Well, 
it was just based on um, what they measure from the soil moisture sense. Yeah, but they don't have anything specifically programmed for um, to water to measure the water levels going into the plant. Great job, ladies, on doing this project. Like, really, really great job. Um, my question for each one of you is individually, what was one of the biggest challenges you had when working on this project, and how did you overcome that? Um, for me, as, as part of the design team, because I can't like, really speak for the whole project in general. Oh, I guess I can, actually. But I think near the end, when we kind of um, told each other information on how each thing works, um, was kind of connecting um, our grounds, all our grounds together, because there's only a certain amount of um, ground outputs in the Arduino. So it's kind of like trying to figure out putting all the grounds together and soldering it and putting um, all our positives and soldering it. I would say for me, since I was in charge of the 3D printing design, it was creating the backpack or the back case of our casing because I had to make sure to measure every like little thing like based on the pins and everything to make sure that it would fit correctly. So I had like two prototypes before I went to, we had the final one that was able to like um, fit on the actual um, web, the LED matrix. Yeah. Uh, thank you, and for me, I would say uh, not lack of communication, but since it is after school, I feel like there is many times where some of us wouldn't come and there'd be few people in each subgroup. Uh, but we do use a, an app, a platform called Slack, and we would, uh, you know, the key is communication. So whatever we would do, like the people that are there, we would communicate, you know, as much as we can. And we would even sometimes meet during school to kind of catch them up. So I feel like that would be one of the uh, most challenges, especially because a lot of us at the time were either juniors or seniors, so we had a lot of, uh, you know, AP classes and, um, you know, college courses and whatnot. But yeah, I think Slack definitely helped with that and our communication skills as well, uh, which this program definitely helps us improve. But... Um, I would say for me, uh, I think one of the bigger challenges was after putting everything together, it felt like um, some problems were coming in because sometimes it would work perfectly. And then there was days where I guess something went wrong and it wasn't reading correctly. Or we would have like, um, half of us would have it work and the other half, it was just not working. And so we would have to change certain components or we had to go through the entire comp like um, circuit all over again. And I think it just helped to have um, apart from our mentors and apart from like the actual staff, we also had like seniors and we also had um, people who were like a little better at coding and they could like identify problems just looking by looking at the code. So I think it's um, also just like the community we were able to build and having um, peers being able to like tell us and kind of guide us through the small like problems that would appear out of nowhere. Anybody else? Okay, well, I have two things to say. Number one, you guys make a great engineering team. Uh, that was the most interesting thing for me to see how you were able to dovetail things together. That's a professional skill, very good. And the second one is, do you know how hard it is to get adults to project their voice loud and clear? You guys speak very well. Very good. Thank you. Let's give them a hand again, please. Thank you.